This program was produced through a grant from the Jerome Foundation. There was a time, and not too long ago by count of years, when the Sioux were known throughout the great northern plains for the skill and prowess of their hunters. Today, though so much has changed about their culture, there still are mighty hunters among the Sioux, their artists. Herman Red Elk tracks the spore of the past. Through his work, he recaptures the glory of earlier times and places in order to enhance and illuminate the reality of the Indian present. consisted of uh, two Sioux tribes. My uh, Sioux heritage comes from the Yankton Sioux tribe. I know my grandfather, they, soon after the battle of, uh, uh, Custer battle, well, I guess they moved to Canada and they had several bands of Sioux up there, so they left some up there and then we come back to Fort Peck, army post there brought us in there and I, we uh, stayed there and that's how come the reservation was originated there at that time. I don't know what years it was, but then was, that's what my grandfather was telling me and my dad. And so we have this Yankton tribe. My my particular tribe, they call it, they refer to it as the Upper upper Yankton, Yankton A. So we're scattered through uh, North Dakota, South Dakota. The olden days, they leave the growing of a male child to be tutored by his grandfather because he was the one that had the most experience in life and he was the older patriarch of the tribes or your family. And therefore, we had our lessons from him of life, uh, what to do in many small areas of life like hunting, like skinning animals or just the general everyday life, how to conduct yourself in the presence of elders. And we had a lot of respect for our elders in those days. And my grandfather, he told me, in the future, your future looks bad to me, that when sometimes you'll have a good horse or sometimes you'll have something real good and a white man will either get it from you, either fool you, or he'll dazzle money in front of you so that he'll get it from you. But the white man was going to get what you got. Or if you let him, he'll have everything that you have. So you better be very careful how you live your life in the future. And don't trust the white man. The future for Herman Red Elk began on March 27, 1918, in Montana at the Fort Peck Indian Reservation about 10 miles west of the little town of Poplar. The year I was born, I was born in a tent. That year, my father started building a house, a frame house so, for our family. I remember the house looked something like this frame building here. It had three rooms in it. After I came Two years old, three years old, my, my my grandfather put me on a horse and he took care of me after that. And I went with him wherever he went. I was either riding in a wagon or riding a horseback. And on, our, on our travels in, around the immediate area of our home, he told me about our, his young days while he was in, in the war parties on the horse stealing raids and, and many things in his life that he told me about. And we, he taught me all those between uh, when I was three and, and five, uh, telling me about the importance of an individual's everyday life, about uh, his, his morning prayers and his evening prayers. And that time, my mother always had dinner ready for lunch or, or a meal ready for us every time we come home. She would cook for us and we'd eat. 
Then we'll take care of our horses and then take them out to pasture. When I was going on six, uh, six years old, my father told my grandfather to take me to school. So, so when I had, I had, when I went to school, well, they told me I had to get my hair cut because I had two braids. So I didn't like that. My grandfather didn't like that. And he came, told my dad not to do it several times. But when my grandfather was away, he, he uh, my father cut my hair. Instead of writing words, I was making pictures. I was more interested in making pictures than learning how to talk English. I didn't learn English the first two years, but around the second grade and third grade, I was learning a bit more about English. Most of the time, I was working on pictures and drawings. When I was in the third grade, they had a drawing contest up in the sixth grade class. One of my teachers entered one of my drawings in the contest and I took first place. Later on they had another contest and they took me up to another room and made me draw again with a sixth grade class. We had an assembly room of second, third, and fourth grades all in one room. And they had a little paper for those three classes. Each one of us had to draw a picture for the cover. And I, and I drew most of the covers on a little paper that we had. Reservation there was about 1927, and I think I was just about nine or ten years old at that time. And settlers were coming in; they homesteaded most of the Indian land on reservation, so they wanted to get these livestock off the road. I mean, off the range. So we they had this roundup, and that's the first time I ever saw a great group of horses. And I had a privilege of riding herd on several groups that they were having processed yet or to set, be shipped off to the canners. And, yeah, those horses call, carried my dad's brand. There were, must be about close to 300 horses. And that time I saw that roundup, I saw about it. 8,000 horses coming in all one place. And if you can hear uh, five, 600 horses running at the same time, you just shiver. You get scared. During that time, too, I ran into a wild stallion. He took after me. He was wild. He was mean. He was old. You can tell he had a mane that was hanging down to his knees. And braids rolled. And it was all matted. And his tail was dragging on the floor. And they had an awful squeal on them. Horses, when they take after you, it scares the heck out of you. Even my horse. The horse took off, so I just let him go. And from that last roundup, Herman Red Elk in the following years did take off. Though still Indian, he began moving more and more into the white man's world. And his experiences there, though always conditioned by his cultural background, weren't terribly different from the experiences of any young American in those years. There was high school, with an emphasis on sports, an early marriage, a wartime hitch in the army, where he fought at Guadalcanal and other South Pacific outposts places as alien to the kid from Fort Peck as they were to other young Americans, white or red, from Topeka or Tallahassee. After his discharge, like a lot of other young Americans, 
He took up a trade, electrician. In 1960, I had a touch of pneumonia on one side of my lung. And at that time, during one of the uh, cultures, they found a bug in, in, the, in this culture, in this test. It's one tuberculosis bug, and, and they sent me to a Sioux Sanatorium here in Rapid City. I stayed there a year, two years before I was arrested. And then they told me I couldn't go back to the kind of work I was doing, making a living for myself and my family. And they sent me to a state rehabilitation department here in Rapid City. And sort of directed me towards artwork, and ceramics, and anything that's connected with this art field. What they, whatever they had there. And from there, they sent me to, to workshops. I went to a 10-day workshop in Black Hills Teachers College at Spearfish. My instructor there, Mrs. Tollison. And that's where I learned to use colors, learned to use oil paints. And that's where I started painting scenery pictures going to want to wear those colors together, yes? But now we have a good example right in front of us. Here we have a gal with a light pink blouse on. Now that is a tint. About 1963, I started learning about color. Before that, Lillian Ostrander took me into her shop in her home and taught me ceramics. And she showed me many of the works that she did, which I learned looking at those works that she did. She was teaching ceramics at the time at the Black Hills Workshop and Rehabilitation Center. So that is where I got into designing on greenware. That is coloring before they glazed it. That I got into china painting and script writing on these china plates. They consist mostly of marriage license or um, anniversaries or birth certificates. I learned how to write with gold pen or gold brushwork. But if the move into the world of mature art was a giant step forward for Red Elk, it was also a return to a vital past, to not only his own early days, but to the early life of his people. I have lived the Indian life. I have lived with the animals. I have lived with reverence for our people and, and their horses. Grandfather told me a lot about the way people are supposed to live. He taught me many things about horses and the birds. And he said they're all like people. They are intelligent animals. They are intelligent birds. They all have a purpose in the and this earth. Many times we traveled, he'd ride in the wagon. He'd put me on my saddle horse tied behind the wagon. And we'd travel that way for many miles. Sometimes I fall asleep. And the horse, and good thing he tied me up to the saddle because otherwise I would have fallen off. Grandfather talked about my future what we are going into. He said he'd be a lot different than what we're living in our Indian life and Indian ways. He said we can learn many things about the other cultures. My grandfather talks to me a great deal about animals. So that's what makes me think about horses and animals. I like to draw horses more than most anything else. I've been around horses so much in my young life that they seem to be with me at all times in my mind. I was able to tell what's going to happen, what the horse is going to do by watching his ears or the way he holds his head. Many times I watch, I watch horses and get ideas from the horses, the way they are going to move 
or were there looking. Most of the time I lay at night when I go to bed and I think about the hap happenings. My life together with my father, my grandfather and my mother. I think about all the, those things that they tell me at an early age. I always regret not being able to write down all they told me. Sometimes some of that life comes back to me and I remember what they say. I can always think back and always wish to be back in the life where it was much simpler and easier life to live than we have nowadays. Grandfather's horses were always calm. They always seemed to listen to him and do as he says. He talks to them in Indian all the time and they all seem to understand. He calls his horses his grandchildren or his grandchildren. He speaks to them about going to water or taking them out to feed. He usually says to them in Indian, this day you worked hard. And now I'm going to take you to water and get your fill of water. Then you will, I will turn you out to pasture that you will feed well today. And you can rest as you have done good work this day. And so the old man speaks to his horses and talks of them with his young grandson. And years later, the boy, a mature man himself now, remembers the grandfather lore, the wisdom of the elders, and passes it along to a new generation. For in any culture, the artists are the keepers, the carriers of legacy, the transmitters of tradition. in his paintings, Herman Red Elk serves Sioux cultural survival in his daily employment at the Sioux Indian Museum and Craft Center in Rapid City. Days when I work at the museum, I come into contact with hundreds of tourists, white people, and all nationalities. And I was, my job is always to be happy to answer any questions that they have in, in old Indian traditions or or whatever is bothering them, and, or whatever they wanted to know. There's a lot of uh, non-Indians that are doing, getting into Indian culture on Indian dances and beadwork, and and they're very interested in, in a lot of our craft work. And we ha have exhibits on craft work, and, and all of that is real beautiful, and all of that is real interesting, the way they do it. So they're learning how to do that. In fact, we got, I got a book here has been published by uh, a white boy. He, he tends high. In fact, I advise him a lot of things too on how to. He's always asking me questions on on, on this art field, uh, skin field, you know, skin uh, work. So I'm always glad to help him out. The museum is not only a place where Red Elk helps others learn, it's a place where he himself learns. Working at the Indian Museum, having these so many one-man art shows, I get pretty much inspired by different techniques, different, uh, different ways of uh, painting, uh, different media that they use. I uh, have a real good opportunity there to study 
all fields of uh, painting, all fields of sketching. And it really interests me, this collage, what they call collage. Of course, we never had that in formal training. So I have a, I have a good job there in that, in that line to learn these many techniques and many feelings of different art. Herman is especially interested in the relationships he establishes here with the younger Sioux artists, the generation of such rising young talent as Robert Penn, Arthur Anyot, Donald Montalo. This uh, art uh, they got nowadays is really interesting because it's another field. It's an educational, educated department where these people got educated and had four years of college and art had their degrees in, in teaching and in artwork. And then those are the boys that's coming up with a real strong modern day art and that track. Something, some levels of artwork, I don't know what it's all about, but they have a certain feeling towards them. And color layout and the composition. Um, the difference between the these artists nowadays is that I'm older and what these younger artists do is get their experience and uh, or try to understand the past life by research and they do a pretty good job of uh, researching in that area because there's quite a few older people like myself still living yet that remembers that stuff and they can go to any one of them they can tell you about different parts of Indian life in the early days so the difference is that I have a feeling. So I think in my artwork, I try to follow that pattern in my artwork. Whereas, you're going to put a picture down with an Indian on it, be sure that Indian is on her like they used to ride in the old days. That's where some of these young artists have, have missed the whole pictures where they don't have that uh, actual experience that I had. I've seen my my brothers and my in the tribe. They all ride horseback and see what they wear, and I've seen the old Indians ride in their in their with their customs and with their old time saddles. They call them pawakis. They just kind of a pad on a horse at the time, a horse with a rope, and they sit on those for. They have to do some long traveling. With Herman Red Elk's affectionate reverence for the old days, the old ways, it is only natural that much of his artistic effort is directed toward the practice of the fundamental technique of skin painting. The most important function of skin painting for the early Sioux was its employment for the annual tribal winter count. Every year the winter count was always the chief's way of keeping a record of his tribe. The winter count consists of drawing on a buffalo hide after it is cured and tanned. The artist uses bone brushes and earth colors, and he boils the buffalo hoofs to make glue, and he keeps his glue warm and, and thin, and thin it with water, and puts the pictographs on the buffalo skin with the bone brushes. The picture for the year is selected by the tribal chief and its, and, its, and its counselors. They usually think of the one most important happening for that year. The winter count is also a count the tribe's death. The winter, winter count usually starts in the middle of their buffer robe and goes counterclockwise and goes to the left and up and over to the right. They count different things like horse stealing, how many horses they stole from the enemy. Through the Sioux winter counts, we learn about the high years of their culture. But for any artist, red or white, his whole work is a kind of personal winter count, a recording, a summing up of the days of his years. It's a kind of reckoning on the wide-stretched canvas of the artist's mind, a remembrance of things past a wondering about things to come. I think the future is revolving too fast. And yet I want to try to get in all the art I can in all its different forms. There are many fields in this art and I try to keep in the old traditional. In, 
in the ancient art of our people. I can see as I get older that art is so broad, so tremendous, and it's feel that it can't be done by anybody. It's kind of an individual thing. I like to try one thing sometimes. If I ever get a chance to, is to uh, shoot a buffalo and skin him and cure the hide and tan it so that I can work on it in the old traditional way of painting. Winter count or design work on the buffalo robes. There's a lot of things I don't understand about this art. Like I say, the feel is so tremendous. The abstract. I just can't get the feel of it. Most, mostly, I go from realism to semi-abstract or modern. It's what they told me I was doing, but it's all traditional in the old Indian way. So today, the mature Herman Red Elk, an accomplished artist living in both the red and the white man's world, bridges two cultures through the exercise of his art. In using this method of reaching out toward persons, Herman Red Elk is working in a great tradition. It's a Sioux Indian tradition. In a word-oriented society, we forget that there have been high cultures in the past that chose other means of communicating and preserving their values. For the Sioux, with his reverence for the physical as well as the metaphysical spheres of our beings, with his awareness of signs, portents, significations, Plastic representation was a natural way of capturing the flowing vitality of his universe. He spoke, as Herman Red Elk speaks today, to the eye, and through the eye, to the heart. I have in my picture painting it wanted the truth, the one of truth and try to make it as authentic as possible in the old Indian life the way they lived in the early days. So I think you might call that honesty to put forth what people didn't live and what you have understand to be the truth. Thank you.